Hey guys, Caitlin here. And for this week's video, I wanna talk about how you can quickly read an EKG in the emergency department. There are many different parts of an EKG, and if you're like me during school, you're getting bogged down in the details. This video will talk about the emergent and pressing details of an EKG that you need to see in the emergency department. I will also talk about the systematic approach to reading an EKG that makes sure that you don't miss anything that is emergent. So let's get started. So what are those systemic manifestations that cause EKG changes? So obviously there's the arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation, you got that irregular, irregular rhythm there, or you can talk about VTAC or VFib. Then there's myocardial infarctions causing STEMIs or NSTEMIs. And then never forget about the electrolyte imbalances like hyperkalemia. The very first thing I do when I evaluate an EKG is look at the rate and the rhythm. And for this, I like to go down to lead two at the bottom of the EKG and look at the rate using the 300 rule and the rhythm looking if it's regular or irregular. Seen here is a normal EKG. I go to the bottom lead two to evaluate the rate and the rhythm. If your EKG doesn't automatically spit out a heart rate, then the 300 rule is a great tool to use when evaluating the rate. Every big box has a numerical meeting. If your QRSs are one big box away from each other, then the rate is 300. If your QRSs are two big boxes in distance, then the rate is 150, and so on. The rate for this EKG is just under 100, so approximately 90 beats per minute. And of note, not all rhythms are regular, and not all regular rhythms are atrial fibrillation. AFib usually presents as irregularly irregular rhythm, and other rhythms like AV blocks can be irregular, but they have more of a pattern of irregularity. For example, the pattern seen here is atrial fibrillation. The rhythm is irregular and unpredictable. The rhythm seen here is a type of AV block. Can you guess it? Right. This is a Mobitz type 1 or Rinky Bach. With this rhythm, the QRS is dropped every fourth beat causing an irregular rhythm, yet it is predictable. The next thing I evaluate takes the most amount of time, but you want to spend a good amount of time on this part because it, it can be easily missed on EKGs, and that is looking for ischemia changes, like T-wave inversions, Q-waves, or ST elevations or depressions. And what I typically do for this is look through every single lead, all 12 of them, first for Q-wave changes, and then I go back to the beginning and I evaluate for T-wave inversions. And then I go back to the beginning for the third time and I look for any ST elevation or depressions. I know it sounds mundane, but it's very important to do this. And then always compare these results with a previous EKG if your patient has it. The EKG seen here has a noticeable sign of ischemia called ST elevations or otherwise STEMI. The elevations can be seen in leads V2 through 5, so this is an anterior STEMI. Can you guess what's wrong with this EKG? Nice! You can see that there are T-wave inversions in the inferior leads 2, 3, and AVF. If this is different when comparing to a previous EKG, then this is a concerning sign for cardiologists. The last thing I like to do is evaluate for the QRS and the QT intervals. And I don't like my QRS longer than 120 milliseconds and my QT longer than 500 milliseconds. But this can change based on the demographics of the patient. And what I like to do is just go to the top of the EKG and look at the numeric value that the EKG has already pointed out for me. There are certain electrolyte abnormalities and arrhythmias that can manifest as lengthening of these two intervals. So it's very important that you take a look at these. Hyperkalemia, or elevated potassium levels, has dangerous cardiac manifestations and EKG changes. The first sign of elevated potassium levels is peaked T waves, which can be seen here in leads V3 through 5. Then the next EKG change is elongated PR intervals and widening of the QRS, which is also seen here. These patients can decompensate fast, so getting the cardiac stabilizer of calcium gluconate or calcium chloride into the patient is very important for cardiac cell stabilization. So, in conclusion, the first thing you need to do is look at the rate and the rhythm, 
and then evaluate for any ischemic changes like Q waves, T wave inversions, or any ST changes, and then look at the QRS and QT intervals. And these five things should tell you some of the most dangerous things that can happen in the emergency department. But just never forget about the clinical picture of the patient. If a patient's having a pulmonary embolism, look for tachycardia on the EKG or the S1, T3, Q3 pattern. Or if the QRSs are very small or you see electrical alternands, consider a pericardial effusion at that point. And that's it, guys. Thanks for listening. See you next Wednesday.